it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Michael Pilon all the way from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. How are you doing, buddy? Very good, Howard. And it's a, an honor for me to have been invited. This is a, I do watch a lot of the pods on replays because I'm never around for the live ones. And there's a lot of stuff on your site that's so much fun. In fact, I think it's made dental education um, just jump, you know, a big step. We're very lucky to have it. Well, you know, the reason I wanted to invite you is I, the, uh, I think the, you were one of like the first five or 10 people I ever even met on the internet before there was message boards. I mean, we're going yes. all the way back into the early nineties. Um, yeah. and you were, uh, you had the coolest, it started off with email groups uh, and you were Mike on the bike and you figured out how to make some weird signature thing with dashes and, and shapes oh, or it was a bicycle, right? Remember that? I had a ham radio set on my bicycle at one time. I used to talk around the world going to work. <laughs> and <laughs> kind of weird, eh? And it's funny because the more things change, the more they say the same. I mean, the telegraph would just evolved into the telephone on the same copper wire, which evolved yeah, into the internet. True, yeah. this, this whole thing that everybody's calling social media, they don't realize that when we were kids in Kansas, every third or fourth barn had a ham radio. And, and oh, nice. grandpa yeah. would, uh, you know, the, the, the sun went down and you're done for the evening and they go out there in the barn and get on that ham radio and talk to other farmers all around the country and the world talking world, about farming. Yeah. Isn't and, that, and, and, I didn't know that. And the that, cars yeah. had CB radios. Remember when the CB radio oh, yeah. came out? I mean, what's yeah. the difference between that and an iPhone? I mean, you were still talking to the That's other true. truckers. Well, one night uh, around the time my daughter was born, so that's 35 years ago, my wife would get up and feed her, and I would take care of the babies and take their diapers, get to sleep. And I turned on my radio. I had a big beam antenna. I pointed it towards the South Pacific, and I talked to a guy named Tom Christian, a direct descendant of Fletcher Christian from Pitcairn Island. That was so, my gosh, and the mutiny on the bounty, and there I was. <laughs> that I, Yeah, so this, uh, um, you know, it's kind of like a, uh... Uh, who was it? Uh, um, Strizy Nunes says he says if I if I saw farther, it was only because I stood on the shoulders of so many legends. And this yeah. social media, uh, Facebook, is a direct descendant of ham radios and CBs oh, yeah. and all the way back to the telegraph of just we're yeah. social people and we like to meet and share Isn't and that talk true? to yes. people. Let me let me read your bio, Doctor Michael Pilon. Grew up in a suburb of Montreal. He is fluently bilingual in French and English. He's a graduate of Loyola of Montreal with a cum laude BS Bachelor of Science in Chemistry Biology. He attended McGill Dental School and joined the Royal Canadian Dental Corps and had a subsidized education. He did a postgraduate in public health at the University of Toronto. He served for 23 years in eight provinces as a single person till his mid-30s when he was offered the easy person to move. He also served on UN peacekeeping duty in Cyprus and in a moment yeah. of weakness, he volunteered for a three-week paratrooper course with the Canadian Airborne Regiment and proudly earned his wings. There's my sweatshirt. <laughs> in dental There's school, my airborne. In dental school, he discovered that he could take standby flights to Canada and NATO bases, and he visited Europe eight times for a cost of only $2 per flight. His website, www.40countries.com, outlined some of his travels, which included... 45,000 kilometers or 25,000 miles hitchhiking in 20 of the 40 countries he visited. Dr. Pilon entered private practice in Ottawa, which is with a wonderful family and cultural city. July 1 is Canada Day and a great celebration in Ottawa. One Canada Day, Dr. Pilon photographed some inebriated teen urinating on the war memorial. The bad part was the government officials were reluctant to take steps such as posting centuries at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. After much persistence and a bit of you do it or I will hang you, uh, the War Memorial is now a center of tourism and respect. He recently sold his practice to a great group, Canada Dental Corporation, and he will be retiring this November 2017, but he plans on keeping active in many areas. Uh, my God, I, I met you on uh, back when it was originally email groups. I want to talk about the evolution of that because the reason mm -hmm. I did Dental Town was my love of the email groups, but the email groups still remind me of the Facebook groups to this day where it's just a, a constant stream of emails with no order. There's no uh, um, 
Um, like, like, like someone would come on and say, okay, I broke a file in MB2, what would you do? And all these people would pile on and really try to explain everything, and it would just be the most amazing discussion. And then a month later, some new <laughs> lad would join, and he'd ask the same question, and we're like, ah, we just totally exhausted that a month ago, so they kind of answer it. And then a month later, a new guy would join, he'd ask the same question, and no one would even reply, and then that guy would say, well, the, the, these guys... You know, they're a bunch of duds, and I and I saw the need that um, it needed to be organized into root canals, fillings, crowns, practice management, and these conversations need to be archived so that when some kid comes along with a very specific question, they can go right to it immediately. Whereas I don't see that with the email groups, the Facebook, the Twitter. I mean, how how could you learn how to do a root canal on Twitter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or do it live on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. No, it really is good. It, it's an education. It's um, a number of times I'll be just reading through, and I like the fitness one, for instance, and I got a couple of ideas there. I try to keep as fit as I can. I'm not 21 anymore, so, but I keep the weight down. I keep the heartbeat down, and it's it's you learn things on the fitness one that you guys have, how to keep fit. Oh, the thread on how to keep fit? Yeah. Yeah, I like and, that one. Yeah, and uh, and then the other thing, it's a more honest conversation on dental time because on Facebook, if you disagreed with someone, they'll just delete you as a friend. And it's, so it's yeah. a, quite a different psychological deal when you're going into an open forum uh, where if you don't like what someone says, you know, if they said it disrespectful, you can hit report abuse. And then volunteer moderators look at that and say, okay, were you guys just disagreeing in a nice way or were you uh, throwing mud? And, um, but I, I think, uh, dental town is a lot more, um, organized and honest discussion where people can, you know, you can post something and I saw many implant case day. And so in the first comment was that, you know, it's okay, but I, I would have done root forms, you know, well, if that happened on Facebook, you just say, well, you're an asshole. I'm going to delete you and, and block you. And you can't come to my page anymore. Cause we only do minis, you know? Yeah. So, so oh, it's a, quite an education thing, isn't it? You you participate, you learn a little something almost every time you check it out. It may, may not agree, which is fine, but it's quite amazing. Like here, you and I are talking around the world. And I've got something the size of a wallet. Like I don't have my computer doesn't work for uh, Skype because it's the, the plug-in for the camera. This is quite amazing when you consider back, you know, and your your grandfather and his ham radio would be just loving this. <laughs> And Microsoft um, just bought or bought Skype uh, a few years back for like oh, eight point nine billion, and now they just turned around and bought LinkedIn. So I'm wondering if uh, sooner rather than later, uh, when you're uh, talking to a friend on LinkedIn, if you just push a button and it'd be like FaceTiming each other on an iPhone. Mm hmm. That's amazing too. I have neighbors who um, were visiting the south of Switzerland and the north of Italy. And they were on FaceTime with their grandchildren a couple of blocks away. You know, that is remarkable. And I got my dad at 89 years old on the Internet. He just loved it. Uh, he, he was always technical. And all of a sudden, he's Googling the old town he grew up in in Ontario. And so on. it's quite exciting. Quite exciting. So what, what was your first experience on uh, the Internet in dentistry? What was your first? Uh... Um, I think just talking to other dentists. And, well, what was uh, the forum? Was it Yahoo uh, group? One I was on was Dental. No, not Dental Town. The IDF. Uh, Dave Dodell's IDF. Internet Dental Dave Forum. Dodell's, yep. Which I was also I, born in Phoenix. That's right. Yes, I visited uh, Dave. We had the convention many years ago, and um, it was quite exciting. You know, you, you ran into dentists from across North America, then around the world, and it was quite interesting to find someone in Brazil who was doing techniques that you were doing. Or maybe doing them better, you know. And it's, I'm I'm an internationalist. Uh, if I had to light, live over again, I'd probably learn more languages. <laughs> and so that's all. There, there was another one. Um, there was a Root ZX. Were you ever yeah, on that one? No, I wasn't. That was all all endodontist. So you could get on that. All you had to do is lie and say you're an endodontist. Yeah, yeah there was uh, another one. I can't remember. Mike Mike Moran, I think he, he had a. Forum. Oh, Generation Next with Michael Generation Mike Next. Maroon. Maroon, that's it, yeah. And that was a cool was name, Gen, and then it was R-A-T, Next. So it, was, it yeah. sounded like Generation Next, but it was G-E-N-R, numeral 8-T, the Next. Generation Next, Mike Maroon. 
And I met Mike Barr. He was on a, I think he was yes. the first Dennis I remember. But I think it was a, was it a, a Yahoo group or, or, no, or it's one of those that's no longer here, like Comspan or. Yes. Um, what was the one? There's a Canadian the group too, iCanadan. Right. And I'm on a couple of French ones that I check into every now and then. That's um, sort of interesting. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to just look at pictures. Sometimes people show a case. And it's inspiring if you've never done it before. When I far started doing uh, implants about 20, 25 years ago, I don't place them, but I just do the final part. It was kind of fun to talk to people who'd done a number, what to watch out for, and the success. It's, it's quite exciting. I also thought, a, uh, and we also got on these groups before there were emoticons. So a lot yes. of times people didn't get someone's dry sense of humor. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could say something as a joke where you type it, bust out laughing, and then the person on the other side thought you just, you know, totally slammed him and dug him and, you know, was all upset. And a lot of times you saw these arguments where you could just see that people didn't understand the other guy, especially if you knew both of these people, you know. Uh, well, my biggest problem on the um, um, email ones is I'm a horrible speller and I didn't check things out. Now they've got the spelling correction. And I joined one forum and someone came on my hide quite quickly. If you're going to be a professional, learn to spell. I speak English and French, fairly good Spanish and German. So I wrote them back in the four languages. There was a dentist on from uh, Greenland who was, who, edu who was educated in German. He came back to me in perfectly fluent German. So I got floored a bit. <laughs> but it's part of the fun, you know. It's, and there's it's, another thing like I see people... Um... Uh, um, I see people saying, well, um, you shouldn't put the DR in front of the name and then the initials after the name. And they, they say, you know, it's either like Howard Friend DDS, but it's not Dr. Howard Friend DDS. It's one or the other. And I say, and I, I'm thinking to myself, well, that, that's very American of you. Because, you know, if I put Howard Friend DDS, there's a lot of dentists in a lot of countries that wouldn't even know what that means. I mean, there's DDS, there's bds there's all these alphabet soups after the initials and then some countries especially in the middle east um they know that when you see that name you wouldn't know if that was a boy or a girl because it's not a matthew mark luke or john name in, in north america so they'll start yeah. with mr or ms and then the dental lectures after so it's uh it's uh it's the the earth is really uh merging into one in fact we, you could really say we, we're down to one language now which is zero and ones because people uh, can take <laughs> your French and German, and as long as it's digital, they can translate it. Yes. The, uh, the other one is we have DMD in Canada now, Doctor Dental Medicine. That's the big new one. Even McGill has that for some reason, and that's a big change. And, and I, I don't like that because um, I think the customer comes first. And I've, uh, I've answered, I've had so many patients ask me, what's the difference in a DDS and a DMD? And if there, there's, if there's zero difference, then there shouldn't be a difference because it confuses the consumer because there is, is, is there a difference between an MD and a DO? <laughs> I mean, if you, if you talk to them, they, they, they think they have some different beliefs, but if, if, there, yeah. if, if there's no, uh, the last seven dental schools open in the United States were all DMD. So, uh -huh. so I've been told there will never be a new DDS school again. And I'm like, okay, well, if the last seven are DMD, we, we ought to, we ought to pony up and say, how many, uh, how many are there and go to one just for the consumer's sake. Yeah. It could be confusing. Um, like I said, I, I've just noticed it coming in more, you know, as more and more schools go to the DMD for some reason, or I, I still never figured out the logic of it if it's the same um you know the same profession we're in so i just kind of just i call them suits the suits in the, in the back room decide these things and i leave it at that well one is dds is doctor of dental surgery and one's doctor of medical dentistry and i i think they're trying to go to a more oral systemic whole body For sure oh yeah Instead of just teaching can, a dentist to be a dental surgeon, doctor, dental yeah. surgery, instead of all surgery, trying to be more holistic. Yeah, make it sound different. I don't know. Yeah, I never did figure that one out. And, uh, well, I, I want to ask you this. Um, I want to get you on the show just to think you're a great guy, and I do love you. I've been to your website and looked <laughs> at all your pictures, all that stuff. But um, podcasters are young. 
these are millennials. You know, old guys like us are uh, reading books and going to conventions, and they're 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 learning how to place implants on YouTube and online CE at Dental Town. And and uh, now that you're going to sell your practice in November, and you're talking, well, it's about already that. sold. Okay, so it's already sold. I've so how many? So you're at the very end. You're selling your practice, and yeah. you're talking to thousands of kids who just walked out of dental school. What advice would you give them on their journey to get from where they're at now to where they'll be at someday with you? Selling yeah, their well, practice? yes. Well, one of the things I found is I had to learn, and part of this little t things I'm going to be sharing come from my experience with the military and some of its private practice, you can call it management or leadership. If you're in the military, you're a leader, but to be a good leader, you have to be a good manager. If you're in private practice, you want to manage, but to be a good manager, you have to be a good leader. So I may inadvertently interchange. I think the main thing is, um, I, I wrote an essay that, that some of this will be based on when I did my public health on the three types of leadership and the, um, uh, I got a fairly good mark on it. It was, I think, an A or something. And he said he would have given me an A+, plus, but I didn't offer any suggestions to correct any faults. And so I actually did this in his office. I stood to attention, snapped a smart salute, and I said, that's the answer in the military. It's, yes, sir, and you carry on. He kind of liked that. But do you want me to go through some of the things that I found? Absolutely. Whatever you think okay. would be best, to, whatever knowledge you think would be best to transfer to all these young uh, dentists listening to you. Well, the first two are things to avoid, and the last one we'll go into in more detail. So you have a uh, presentation? I, you, you have some slides you want to show, Ryan? No, I don't have slides, oh, unfortunately, okay. but okay. I've got a, a couple of little things up. The first uh, type of leader uh, I call laissez-faire, which is a French word. Do you use that in the States? Yeah, laissez-faire. Oh, laissez-faire, yeah. Okay. It's, I, the, uh, the transliteration would be loosey-goosey. I was in a couple of big clinics in the forces, and I'm not heaping on the forces because I had some really good leadership. But in this particular case, we had one, it was a, a dental course school, a staff of 55 at the school. We taught hygiene, assistants, lab technicians, lab um, uh, dental equipment techs. We had three-week dental practical courses and so on. And one of the colonels that was there was just kind of loosey-goose. There was no real delegation it's just you came into work and you did what you wanted and it caused a lot of problems once we were this isn't a major thing we were with some dental students who were doing their summer training from the universities and uh, we were going down to toronto to a, a factory that or a company that made uh, anesthesia we it was kind of interesting to see the bus never showed up and so i went to the sergeant's office uh i was a captain and the guy the bigger guy was a colonel Lieutenant Colonel. So I went to the sergeant's office and I said, well, where's the bus? So he started pretended ostensibly looking through for the paperwork. Someone had spoken to him, but he was just playing his own little game. And that, that was a mistake. So, you know, in other words, if you're in a clinic, a young dentist moving in, if whatever role there happened to be in, don't just let things happen. And I've seen this happen in civilian practice. And you talk to some people who work at a practice. And I said, well, how well organized is it? You know, do you, does everybody know their job and so on? And the girl kind of shrugged her shoulders. Well, you know, sometimes people come in uh, half an hour late. No one does anything. So you don't want that. The other one, and the absolute worst, unfortunately, uh, I ran into a few people who were like this, is the kind of the, um, what would you call it, the um, micromanager. Oh, jeez. That is just the worst. And I, in fact, I left the forces, unfortunately, because I was being, it just wasn't fun to go to work. No matter what you do, you've got to really have fun doing it. And people think that because I say that, oh, well, Mike's not serious. I'm as serious as hell. But you can be serious with a smile on your face and get your work done. But the micromanager, I ran into a few. It was rather unfortunate. People would come in instead of saying, well, Mike, uh, how did this go? That project I gave you last week, how's it looking? You know, in other words, to get my feedback. No, it was, well, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? And it, it just wasn't fun anymore. And it, I've heard of this happening in town here, too. We put an application in for a hygienist about 10 years ago, and we got about 20 or so applications. And many of the girls came in and said, you know, well, where we're working is just not that much fun. If a patient misses, the dentist that runs the clinic goes, you know, all angry and it's just not fun and 
you've got to, you know, micromanaging and everything, every detail. If someone misses an appointment, well, okay, I, I just as soon be busy since I'm there, but I'll go and read the newspaper or something. But a couple of clinics I've been told that things get really tense, and that's kind of a, okay, you know, and also we'll, we'll go through a couple of steps on delegation. So micromanagement is absolutely horrible in the dental field or in any field. The big one, the really positive one I'd recommend to any young dentist, even dentists who have been in practice, is delegation. Um, Richard Branson from Mill you know, Virgin Air and so on, quite a remarkable person. He's, uh, he, he's overcome dyslexia, for instance, to, to make a success of life. He just has that knack. There was a very good article on the Internet. People could look it up. And he was talking about you hire the person you think that can do the job. Then you meet with them and uh, make sure that they understand and you sort of back off. And eventually they start doing things the way you'd like and you confer if it's not right on. And uh, it's a very um, it's a very fun thing to do. Just a second, I'll just bring my script down here. It is a fun thing to do. And I had a small or well, it was there were 11 of us at this clinic out in British Columbia in Chilliwack. It was the first time I had my own clinic that was big. I had small clinics. I was in Cyprus with the United Nations and a small clinic in Prince Edward Island. 11, 10 of the 11 of us were our first times at those positions. Two new, you know, two, sorry, two new young graduates, a new or a um, couple of new hygienists who just finished the course, some new dental assistants who were new on the job. The only person who had experience there was a civilian dental assistant who worked there. The lab tech was a sergeant who had been transferred. It was his own clinic. And uh, I would bring in the sergeant. She was kind of the office manager, a young, young lady, very intelligent. And I bring her in every day and I say, okay, how is this going? Uh, do we have, does everybody know their office times? In other words, a manual, an office manual, times of work, when you finish, uh, what's the advanced time you should give if you want to go on leave to confer with you and so on. And then we came every second day, you know, like three times a week. And in a very short while, she was only seeing me Friday mornings at 11 o'clock, which was kind of cleanup time for materials. We never ran out of materials because that was part of the manual. And I was, I got some very complimentary feedback from the base commander. He said it was the best run unit on his base. And this was the home of the engineers. So I was very proud of that and proud of my staff. And I was told it's the highest morale amongst what they call the other ranks uh, in Canada twice in a row my last two years. But it wasn't just sort of, oh, well, let people do what they want. We had one, this is rather sad, we had one young girl. She wasn't helping out with the 11 o'clock cleanups on Fridays. And the sergeant kind of mentioned it to me. You know, like we, That's when they check, make sure the supplies are all up, the recall list for the following week, the whole number of administrative things, cleaning the operatories and making sure, you know, sterilizers worked, all of the good things. So this girl was sort of skipping out. She'd go off and have a coffee break and not come back. So I had to take her aside and I said, look, you know, this, you're part of the group and uh, we all have to work as a team and everybody has their assignment. If someone just disappears, it's going to make it worse. And this is what we call the verbal warning. Now I said, you, you know, we'll be watching you for the next three or four months to make sure things go Within about two or three months, something else happened. I can't remember what it was, but she was just kind of just mousing off and not doing her job and all this. So I had to take her aside, and according to military protocol, you give them a written warning. And I said, no, you've done this, this, and this. And, you know, you're within that framework of the, the verbal warning. We have to give you a written warning. And, you know, you're a smart kid. You can do well. Okay, fine. Then... Within that time frame, she had six months to not do anything bad. She disappears for a week. Well, I was quite worried. I thought maybe she's been in an accident. I called the military police. I said, have you heard anything from anybody? I called the hospital. Was she in the hospital? Nobody knew where she was. Then she shows up a week later. She put herself on a course, which you don't really do. You know, if you came into work and your assistant was gone for a week, so I conferred with the base lawyer and the admin officer, and they said, well, there's only one thing you can do, and that's to recommend her release from the forces, which I felt bad about. But so we did that, and that afternoon I had the, st the staff assembled in a uh, coffee room, and I said, well, I've got a very difficult thing to tell you about, and I told them about that. And I said, but I want you to know I do not have a list of people that I want to get rid of. Um, my son has almost died at birth. That's my big concern. And 
that was that that afternoon it was the strangest environment everybody's laughing and smiling and running around and having a great time like call Bev the sergeant the manager and I said Bev what is going on she said well we've been kind of covering up for her and one of us or two of us would do her work and said and they just felt so good so good delegation in other words if the staff knows what is expected of them how they can achieve it whatever that happens to be like in an office an office manual most offices should have a proper manual when to come to work uh, what the office hours are when the cleanup times are keeping track of materials. Um, the clinic, uh, the private clinic I had had a pretty good crew. We very had, seldom had misses for appointments. So it was all there, like uh, everybody had their little role to do without saying you're the lowest in the ladder. No, everybody had their little role. So this is something that I think is very important to have your staff realize. Some people like meetings. Um, I found myself, I never was too impressed with meetings. I just sort of I'd meet with the, the lab tech, for instance, and say, okay, how's this going? And I, you're, I really like the way you're helping the assistants pour models. And he was happy with that. And um, I was never a, sort of a salesman type of guy, so I never had morning pep rallies. Some people do that and enjoy it. But that's about it. And the bottom line is just like what we happened in Chilliwack is the staff should be happy. Like I, I was very flattered that um, – I was told by a couple of people, it's the highest morale in the country, which is important. You go to work. And um, I've heard of clinics in the civilian world where people sort of are looking to get another job somewhere, which is bad, you know. And, and life is about having fun. Oh, i got to say this while I say this. I enjoy reading your various um, postings from around the world. I get very jealous. I think you were up in the Himalayas, weren't you? You were up in the Himalayas for that. That, that was just so envious of that. But that's having fun, isn't it? So that's about it. In other words, you should have, you know, you should have work manuals for everybody. The assistants have different duties. And that can be anything from ordering supplies, keeping the bay clean when they go home and not just say, well, I've got to go home early today because, uh, you know, we're expecting the movers or something. You know, you got to work that in. And the hygienist, um, we like to keep everybody up to date on their programs. If there's a problem, not to hesitate to tell me if there's a patient who's, Oral hygiene isn't good because I come and enforce that. I'm very keen on that, as I think dentists should be. But it's got to be, you've got to you've got to have certain goals with your clinic. You want to have it busy. If you're um, producing certain work, you want it nicely done and nicely sent out to the lab. Or if you have your own lab, which is even nicer, which the clinic I'm at now has, it's uh, it makes it enjoyable. And people say, well, you must be so happy to be retiring. And I said, you know, I'm retiring while I can still do the work well, but it was never a goal of mine. It may sound simple to some people. I enjoy going to work, and uh, I've got a lot of little things I'm going to be doing. So that's about it, Howard. Is that any questions on that? Um, you are selling your practice to the Canada Dental Corporation. Yeah. Is, is that um, – that's corporate dentistry, right? How, how, um, how long have they been around? How many offices do they have? What, what was it? Hey. Like selling it's the to Dental Corporation of Canada, it's called. It started in Australia. I'm not too sure of the exact numbers, to be honest. The clinic I'm in is very, um, it's a nice group practice. I don't feel any pressure. There's no one coming up to me or anybody else saying, oh, no, we've got to produce this much each month. Because I'd never practice that way. You know, if I have a day where I'm doing exams and nobody needs work, well, that's fine. That's a, That's a, you know. That's a good point for us. In other words, we've got the oral hygiene up. But I'm uh, quite willing to offer, um, you know, implants. And I'm doing a couple of teeth uh, implant-supported complete dentures on one lady who's had some real problems. And I'm looking quite forward to it. Another lady, I had seen her as a patient years ago, and uh, they decided to move. And her, she has a lot of crowns. The problem with crowns, I'm seeing a lot of older people are having crowns fail because there is a – a weakness around the margin, no matter how good it is. So we're doing an immediate denture for her. And uh, I enjoy, I used to do a lot of immediate dentures when I was in the forces, because we had a lot of young soldiers that came from parts of the country where they never saw a dentist. That's less so now. The oral hygiene in the, in the outside community is better. But it's quite nice. There's, um, I should know the numbers, um, in the Ottawa Valley area, there are about 20 clinics, I think different parts of the city. 
So it's it's a fairly varied varied group. So Dental Corp has twenty offices in Montreal. Uh, Ottawa. Uh, oh, Ottawa. So you're yeah, you're, I, yeah you're in uh, um, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. How far away is that from uh, uh, Montreal? No, no, you're um, close to Toronto. No, I'm close to Montreal. It's about two hours to Montreal, and about five or six to Toronto, I guess. Okay, because Montreal's in the province of Quebec, right? It's in Quebec, yeah, just across the river. Just We're right on the border. Yeah, I love Montreal. I've lectured there oh, a yeah. couple of times. That is a classy, cultural city. Oh, I mean, yes. I grew is... up in Montreal and uh, in Dorval, a suburb, and McGill was downtown. It's funny, we had a um, uh, class reunion and we had a wonderful class, very warm. And one of our fellows was quite Orthodox Jewish, and he couldn't drive on Fridays. So we had our little restaurant meal very near his hotel. And I said, uh, Arnie, I said, I guess you've got some strong religious beliefs. And he said, oh, yeah, I never imposed them on anyone. And I said, you know, I did too. I never studied on Friday nights because <laughs> the pubs are so good in Montreal. They were just, uh, that was my regular thing. Well, it's, um, it's interesting how um, the Muslims don't work Friday. The Jewish people don't work Saturday and the Christians don't work Sunday. And yeah. um, it's interesting how um, when you look at uh, demographics of a city, you might say, OK, like if you go to San Francisco, you might say, oh, well, they're overpopulated. Well, if they're all born in America, Christians, uh, mm -hmm. there's not one person in San Francisco open on a Sunday. So you may yeah. go to San Francisco and say, well, I know all the Christians won't work this day. And I know uh, Asians who have gone to America and opened up in San Francisco, and their average Sunday is like seventeen thousand dollars of production because yeah. there's a huge city there, and there's just no one there. And I know, yeah. uh, I know, uh, I'm an endodontist who went to Manhattan, and he said, um, you know, there's no endodontist on Saturday because the majority of them in Manhattan were Jewish, and so that was his target market is to be an endodontist on Saturday, and he was yeah. Jewish. And um, no. so demographics mean a lot. Um, yeah, demographics are interesting. That's a very interesting study, isn't it? Um, like I grew up in Montreal and we had our political problems with the separatists. Like I'm half French and half English. What year was and that? It was that though the big problem was 1971, 72. And I was at an Air Force base down in um, south of Montreal when a man was kidnapped and he ended up being killed. And where he was being held was within sight of the dental clinic where I was. But things are very relaxed now. You go into a place that was speak 72. English, that was yeah. 72. Yeah, I, I still remember that. Like, I was just, I mean, I remember, because oh. I was born in 62, so I was 10, and I yeah. remember hearing the the, uh, the dad and the uncles at the table wondering if Canada was going to go into a civil war. Yeah. It, uh, it, it was quite interesting. This is sort of a strange piece of politics. There's a French Canadian regiment called the Royal Vendeur, the Royal 22nd. The word Vendeur means 22. It got sort of shortened into Vendus. They're a pretty great regiment. There was a young guy guarding a federal building and a separate, he was French Canadian, a separatist came up and spit in his face. So he took his rifle around, hit him in the jaw, and a policeman comes running over, picks the guy up, trips him and said, oh, look, he just fell and hit his face. So the police, the soldiers, the average citizen wasn't into the violence, but it's like any political movement. And um, it's, uh, but Montreal is thriving now. There's a very good article in the London Telegraph about Montreal. They were just, it was on the internet. Very, very flattering, you know, about the, the restaurants, the nightlife, the old cities. My son lives down in an area called the Plateau He's a young musician, thrive or trying to thrive, and a very artistic city, you know. So it's it's fun. I still love Montreal. You need to hook him up with my son. You know, his son's a musician yes. too, Ryan. Well, yeah, I should. And Ryan Ryan is a um, he, he's a world class musician. I mean, I he uh, when he plays that piano, the whole thing just it oh, shakes geez. the whole house. And uh, well, there's a fellow just passed away this weekend. That he was a grunge guy. Oh, right. Geez, I should know. Peter something. It was right, a the lot guy of in from the sound garden, or it was a sound yes, garden. Yes, the sound garden. My was son was about, broken hearted. Yeah, he well, was Grant about, likes that. Sorry, he was in like four or five bands. Yeah, my son likes that type of music. His music, he said, is a combination of Nirvana and Led Zeppelin, and he gets into the psychology of bass notes that makes it sound broader. 
And he's had a few medical problems of late, but he's overcoming those. And he's uh, was just playing outside, just playing the guitar on a on a staircase near her library, and a lady came along and asked her to join a him to join a folk festival. So it's looking good. I can't even clap in time. So <laughs> I want I want to um as far as predictions, I know you can't predict the future because you know uh, not all these. You know, when you young millennials are looking at all these know-it-all experts on the news stations and on all the talking heads, uh, I can assure you that no one predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Arab uprising, no. 9-11, that Trump would win. I mean, so these people are so damn smart the day after. They're, they're, it's like listening to, you know, football commentaries on Monday morning. You know, everybody's a yeah. genius on Monday morning, but where were yes. they with their money in Vegas on Saturday night oh. betting on a, the game that they know everything about? Uh, but this corporate dentistry thing is seems to be a big uh, thing. Do you think um, you you've practiced? How long did you practice? Thirty years? Forty years? How long? No, forty-seven. Forty-seven years. My God, you I'm still go, alive. You should go three more years just to say you did it a half century. Yeah. Well, but, but where uh, where do you our... think dentistry will be? Uh, so you practiced five decades. Yeah, been around it's hard to believe. A half a century, a fifty. I know. Bill. Where's it going to be? Uh, Where's it going to be 50 years from now? Oh. These, these kids listening to you now that just graduated yeah. from McGill last week, what's yeah. it going to look like 50 years? Do you think these corporate dentistry, like the uh, Canada Dental Corporation, do you think that'll be what what percent of the Canadian market do you think is corp, uh, DSMO, dental service management organizations, yeah. like the Canada it's, Dental it, Corporation? No, that's a good question. You see, the problem is when I graduated, the military paid my way through school, but I think even my classmates, dentistry was under $1,000 a year, and it was fairly affordable, and books and tuition. Um, now they're, like a, what is it, a, some of them are coming out with a quarter of a million dollars in, in debt. Oh, there's several so they have schools to to, in America that cost 100000 a year. Oh, my gosh. No, there's a dozen schools. Uh, NYU, oh. UAP, there's a ton of them that cost hundred grand so, a year. So they have to join a group, you know, and this uh, um, is long. See, this is the thing. If a dental group has like good delegation and, and, and so on, lets the dentist do their job, then it could be enjoyable. That would be the question mark. Will, um, if it becomes just for profit and just uh, sell things you shouldn't. I don't know. I, I don't know where to predict. I don't see it going back. Um, I was at McGill at a lecture about a year and a half ago. And Where's I asked McGill? Dean, is I said, it Montreal? It's Montreal, yeah, right downtown, really beautiful campus. And I asked the dean, is anybody in the military? And he sort of gave me a scornful look, no. A dental student in the Canadian Army gets $62,000 a year, plus is everything paid for. 62000 Jeez. I, I, did, I got a lot less than that, but then... How do you, do you think um, in Montreal is in Toronto, is corporate dentistry growing as fast as it is in the United States? Oh yes, pretty well. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the owners have to be dentists, so it's less of a, uh, a sort of an investment company. They have to be dentists. I don't know if that makes a difference, um, as I understand it. Um, but yeah, it's tougher because of the debt that the students have. I feel so sorry for them getting out of school with, like you say, some of them would have half a million plus books and tuition. I, I think that, I, I think it definitely should be um, have to be owned by a dentist. I mean, Hewlett Packard. I mean, David Packard and Hewlett. I mean, those guys were both electrical engineers making that great company. I mean, um, yeah. Bill Gates of Microsoft was a programmer. I mean, when I yeah. look at when I look at non dental industries, um, you know, the the people who make the most value added, greatest industries knew their product. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'd rather. I mean, if I would, I would bet more money on a restaurant being uh, opened by a chef than someone <laughs> with a, uh, a social media degree in communications from ASU. You know what I mean? Yeah, isn't that true? Hey, eh? geez, no, it's it's a very complex one, and I I just couldn't predict the future of it. Um, you know, dentistry's progressed so much with materials. Uh, the implants I've really enjoyed doing and uh, the materials, although I enjoy your articles on amalgam, I agree with that. I won't just replace an amalgam because it's an amalgam and I've had people, um, you know, do that. The other thing, too, if you want a bit of a chuckle, is you look in the Google and you look for best dentist in Ottawa. 
we weren't even allowed to advertise. Oh, I didn't have to advertise. I was in the military, but now you can call your dental clinic the best clinic in Ottawa. I don't know how do how do they decide that? But the our governing body doesn't seem to object. So, so who are the biggest corporate chains in Canada now? Is um, Canada Dental Corp is that the biggest one? Um, there's another one. I, I I never really got interested in who it was because I wasn't going to. You know, I didn't have to be concerned. Altamira, I think, is a big one. And there's Trillium oh, Dental. Which one? Which one? Trillium, and there's Altamira. I'm, I could be wrong there. So there's so one of the DSMOs is Trillion. I Trillium, like how do you, the how flower. T R I. Oh boy, you got the worst spell in the world. T R I L L I U M. Was it trillium. called Trillium Dental Group or just Trillium? Trillium Dental, but that's all I know. I, I've never really looked into it. And what's it. the other one? Altamira, but I could be wrong there. Altamira. I could be wrong. You know, I'm not really just like I said. So it's, what is, it's funny. What is, so what do the what your other colleagues think about corporate rolling in? Are they good with it? Is it scare them? What what are, what what's the mood of the uh, Canadians? Well, most of the people of of my generation that are still practicing don't really care. You know, they're going to sell their practice, and um, I I've had some. Uh, there was one fellow that was working in with us. He's moved to one of their other clinics, and he's very happy with. Uh, Dental Corporation of Canada. It's really good. He worked for another group, and he said it was just awful. Someone was on his hide all the time. You know, you've got to, you've got to produce more, and da, 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 you know that sort of stuff. And that I find is, um, like I've said too. Oh, you know, like I said, I, um, I would not like to. Um, I'll just go and just check out some of these things. But uh, I, I would not like to be pressured. Like I like to, um, you know, have the work that I'm doing is 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 good, you know, and uh, go from there. Um, but uh, if someone comes in and uh, well, an example is when I retired or sold my practice, I we did send a note to everybody. Um, they did, and uh, you know, we'll be here. It's not that it's not that far away, but a couple of people lived in one of the further suburbs, and I got a very disturbing call from her one day her daughter three years ago daughter's 21 22 three four years ago i wrote in her chart with her after her, her, her um, hygiene exam her oral hygiene is great like one millimeter pockets and so on she had one big restoration that had an endo done by someone which the mother couldn't quite understand anyways the mom calls me and she says look uh, my daughter just saw someone nearby and there was she was told she needed nine fillings and I looked at the x-rays and I, I couldn't see anything. I said, but you know, I could miss something. Come on in for free. I'll take x-rays. And I want you in the chair, the room too, to show that I'm not hosing you. One older restoration had a crack. It was a composite. And in the front, there was about five of them. I said, there's, there's not even stains. I did a caries detector because on the, on the lingual of a, of a second um, incisal, there was a bit of a dark spot. It wasn't really a stain. It was almost like a discoloration deep in the enamel. Nothing. And the mom said, why would they do that? And I said, you're an accountant. I think they call it bottom line. So they're coming to see me again. And a, another lady was told she needed $6,000 worth of work. And her teeth were falling apart. Well, I had done implants with her for 25 years. I'd done crowns. She had a lot of big composites. But I said, you know, I'll leave those for now. I, I'm not necessarily going to put a crown on everything that has a little carries in it. So... You know, maybe that has changed. A bit disappointing. I um, dentistry has kind of gone backwards in a lot of ways. Well, I guess everything's a trade-off. If you want your car to get the best mileage, you'd make it out of plastic. If you want it to be safest in a car wreck, you'd make it out of lead. I mean, you know, there's uh, a trade-off of everything. But uh, um, you know, we went from using a filling that was that when you mixed. 50% mercury with silver, zinc, copper, and 10. It expanded, so it had an, an, a phenomenal seal, and it yes. was antimicrobial. And yeah. they lasted 38 years. And our oh, yeah. generation said, well, you know what? Let's make them tooth-colored so they're all pretty. But now when you they set up and you cure them, they contract, so they pull away. And so and they, they all have shrinkage. So at any level of shrinkage, I mean, how that, that bug... Streptococcus mutans is only five microns wide. Any shrinkage, five 
And now yeah. it's, it seems like it's even getting worse because now the trend is bulk fill. So, I mean, yeah. uh, and they, they, they're so concerned with it being pretty. And the bottom line is dentistry doesn't fail from almost anything other than um, bacteria from a biofilm. I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. there's occlusal disease, there's trauma, but the majority of all the failings in dentistry are from bacteria yeah. in the biofilm. And oh, I agree, the, yeah. uh, the fillings that dentists provided were basically averaging 38 and a half years life expectancy mm. with amalgam all throughout the 70s and the 50s. And now they're yeah. replaced by these shrinking, contracting composites and they're lasting six and a half years. And dentists, wow. uh, dentists always say, well, that's because that person's not doing it right. I mean, I'm so sick of that argument. Dude, if I showed you a hundred million fillings, I mean, I know you're special. I know you think you're all that in a bag of chips. You know, I, I know, I know, you, you know, but, but it's, it's not true. I mean, you're no. putting in a shrinking, a filling that shrinks, that leaves a gap in an inert environment. And, and I get it with girls because girls will do damn near anything to look prettier, but you're, yeah. you're talking about some six year old boy who wore the same shirt three days in a row, who doesn't want a shot. It's on his molar. No one, like I've been talking to you the whole time. I haven't seen any of your molars yet. I mean, I, 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 I haven't true. even I haven't even seen a second buy. Um, and yeah. all I've seen from you this whole time is half of your upper front eight teeth. Yeah. So why am I putting oh, a beautiful totally Hollywood agree. cosmetic uh, Universal Studios beautiful filling on your second molar? In, in fact, yeah. I've got to tell you, <laughs> three times in my 30 years. I knew I wasn't going to get, you know, it was a woman, it was a second molar, she wanted porcelain, this back before you had all porcelains, and I just knew that by the time I got enough reduction for the uh, uh, crown, I wasn't going to have any retention, and it would just be a perfect gold onlay. Three times I've sunk a gold onlay on a woman on a second molar who still hasn't figured it out to this day. <laughs> I mean, I knew... I knew, uh, you know, it was Max, sorry. I knew she'd never see it. And I know that the fact that she wanted a tooth color was just absurd because no one's going to see it. Now, if it was a yeah. lower second molar, she could have seen it. But uh, yeah. Max, but you have to, molar. yeah. All well, the thing about gold, molar. too, is the uh, the uh, electrostatic surface, I think, apparently repels bacteria or the, 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 um, the On plaque. the gold? Or yeah. The metal? On the gold. Yeah, there Gold was a lot of research strong. that that, that was uh, one of the CapTech deals. Back when there were PFM, CapTech figured out that they could uh -huh. do it with a technique that used a lot less gold, but by using the more very precious high energy, it was a repellent to bacteria. I mean, yeah, I mean imagine nice. there was two apartments to move into. In one apartment, you walked in, everything was cool. The other apartment, you walked in, and all your hair went static clean every time you touch your wife or your son, there was a big shock or, you know, and they, they just, bugs did not like living under high energy. You saw it the most with uh, gold foils. I mean, I'm in Phoenix, yes. which is 10% Canadian, by the way, 10% of Phoenix yes. is retired Canadians. And you'd see these gold foils that were put in 50 years ago, and you could see with your eye the leaks around the deals and whatever, and they were still there 50 years later. And then yeah. you could do your modern day class five composite um, for uh, root surface decay or whatever, and you could see that thing fail in three or four years. And, yeah, and well, so you years just know that this high energy gold foil was yeah. antibacterial. Yeah, years years ago, about seventy two, I just come back from Cyprus. There was a talk. I, I won't name the company, but they were the first ones with composites. And this guy was going on and saying it's not only as strong as strong as uh, amalgam for compression, it's stronger. And at the end, Dr. Ambrose, who was then the dean, the late Dr. Ambrose, who was just one of our heroes, got up and he said, well, let's wait for the four or five year results to see what happens. Well, they all leaked and all kinds of endo were caused. Then they started to acid etch it, which made it a little better. But there was that, which you mentioned so well, is the compression and contraction just wasn't there. So, you know, all these composites, a lot of them failed. I saw a lot. I went into private practice for two years in 76, and then I got back in the military, and I saw a whole lot of them. And everybody wanted, uh, oh, no, we want the white fillings. And I, this bothers me, too. I see these ads, 
mercury free fillings, you know, yeah, well, what the heck, you know, it's a different world. Yeah, and you see it with fluoridation too. So I've practiced here so long. We we got it fluoridated in '89, Phoenix, and then they right. they just fluoridated it. They they signed the the law was just 20 years, and it's up for review. So then we just went through it again, and uh, it's it was funny how basically uh, 20 years ago and today, um, one out of four Americans um, they just they're very very opposed to it, and and I, and I get yeah. it because a lot of Americans are opposed to it just because they just hate. The government's so bad they, they don't they wouldn't want any help from the government i mean i mean, yeah. they, I mean we, we had poor people voting out obamacare just because they yeah. don't want the government touching your health care then when you say well dude you know you do know that now you won't be able to go to the doctor right you do know that right that you have to pay for it yeah. they'd rather have that i mean yeah. so i understand the anti-government stuff because you go through the history of the world uh, the, 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 the government usually has been the problem more times than the solution. Would you agree? Oh, sorry, I got dogs barking no, in the background. Right. I lived in St. Catharines, which is near Niagara Falls. There was a little town that had fluoridation, and you could see the difference. The kids would come in with very few carries from this town that had uh, the fluoridation in the water. So there are people that are very much against it. There are a few people on the Internet, and, you know, I respect their views, but... Um, I never heard of dental floss till dental school. You can imagine that first year you went up to third year to have your examination and the prof came along and he'd given me hell about dental floss. And when he left, I said to the third year student, what the hell is dental floss? So that has changed. Quebec oral hygiene has gotten a lot better. It used to be, I went to school at the French school, kids in grade six, they had failed a few years. They had dentures. That was a common thing, but that's all changed now. You know, the, the, prevention the hygiene schools it's it's a nice change but you know even that was cultural because i remember when i went my practice in 87 at least once every three months some little girl would come in and she'd say she won dentures and and she might have 10 12 cavities i'd say no 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 yeah. just dude, let's just do the fillings and she'd say my mama uh my grandma got her dentures before she got married my mama got her dentures before she got yes. married and i'm marrying uh in june and i want yeah. i don't ever want to deal with this again i want them all out and i want dentures in there and you're so 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 much uh uh that was even culturally driven culturally driven well the big joke is um i won't mention any areas but what is the greatest present a, a father-in-law future father-in-law can give his future son-in-law and that's a daughter with uh, dentures you know <laughs> it was a kind of an economic joke but um no things have changed a lot it's so nice to see um you know, more people. I had a young fellow in the other days who was 43. He's never had a carries. It was just fantastic. He's flossing like a fiend. But see, it's probably not. It's probably not anything we think it is, though. I mean, we just don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's a different. It's either a different bacteria in the biofilm, or he has yeah. a different um, um, immunological reaction to it from his saliva. Oh yeah, very and, and you also see. That uh, to me, it's very apparent that the people with a lot of gum disease don't have decay, and the people yeah. with all the cavities don't have gum disease. So it's kind of like oh, yes. if Streptococcus mutans is taking over your teeth, something in that biofilm is is checking out the. Uh, uh, it's a very check. complex yeah. mechanism. Yes, it, it's a biology question, and that that's yeah. where I think dentistry needs to go. They all talk like they're a bunch of mechanical engineers: wear rate, bonding rate, strength. You know, yeah. torquing it to this Newton centimeter. And they, they talk like they're all building a house. And I say, yeah. okay, you're going to build a house. And no matter how you build it, in six or seven years, it's going to be eaten by termites. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 those barns in Kansas, they don't fall down because of the wind and the tornadoes and all that stuff. They all fall down mm. from termites. From so, termites, dude. So it's, it's one of those deals where um, I... I think dentistry is going to enter more into the biology zone as opposed to the that, mechanical that makes engineering. Good sense, yes. Uh, we've that lived makes there, good sense. We, we live the, 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 the explosion of dental materials technologies and adhesive dentistry um, started the, the, the cosmetic revolution, bleaching, bonding, veneers. We rode that. And then by yeah. about 2000, that was the 80s. And then by yeah. about 2000, it was all driven by um, the speed of the personal computer, Intel, Microsoft. And then we got into this whole digital revolution with digital x-rays and digital computers and all that kind of stuff like now. And Things um, have changed fast, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I, uh, I got, like I said, I got my dad on the computer at 89. He would have been 103 this year. But, oh, he took to it like crazy. You know, it's so nice. And, uh, well, I just find this amazing. You and I are talking now, and I got a little thing the size of a wallet. And, uh, you know, people yeah, can see it around the world. Are, are you on LinkedIn? Are you uh, on LinkedIn? I, now and then. You are? Now and then I get it on there. Because, now and then. I Because the Skype was bought by Microsoft right. and then they bought LinkedIn. Oh. So I think the obvious play would be that, you know, how you face, do you have an iPhone or a Samsung? I've got a Samsung. Okay, Actually, well, I'm all Samsung. My wife bought these for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, on iPhone, I mean, on iPhone, you can FaceTime each other. Right. And I imagine um, Microsoft's going to do that with Skype on LinkedIn. I mean, I, uh, it sounds like the only... It's the only good reason I could think of that you'd give them eight point nine billion dollars. That's a be. lot of money. Yeah. But my brother, uh, he does a lot of work through Amazon. He was telling me that you he joins for a year, he's got television, he gets free delivery. The world is changing an awful lot. It's um the Uber taxis now, they're quite prominent here, you know, and they're they're quite nice actually, the ones we have here in Canada. So And Amazon has really been a boom for dentistry. Uh, uh -huh. I'll tell you why. Um, the oldest guy that ever went to my seminar was a 92 year old man in St. Joe, Missouri named George uh -huh. Rui. And I, and he told me that, um, he graduated in 27, the stock market crashed in 29 and the depression Ooh. was 32 to 36. And he told me that before the great depression, all the dentists practice outside, but during oh the gosh. great depression, so many stores went under and were boarded up that the prices, the rents fell so low that the oh. dentist for the first time could afford to move inside. Yeah, and he that said wild. that was ground zero for us yeah. becoming a sovereign profession instead of wow. sitting outside cutting hair, shining boots, and her anesthetic was whiskey, yeah. which they used during the, great, during the prohibition. They said yeah. all the cops felt so sorry for people getting oh. extractions that they didn't call it whiskey. It was in a medicine bottle, and they just said it was dental medicine. But Amazon Jeez. is doing the same thing. Every Amazon.com, their stock is worth more than all the other major retailers combined. Walmart, Costco, all of them oh combined. Oh my gosh. And just every amazing. time Amazon sales go up another billion dollars a month, a hundred thousand square foot of retail goes under. So you drive around yeah. all these towns, there's so much vacancy from yeah, retail. Well, it's, it's changing, but but it's great for dentistry because instead of being yeah. in a medical dental building, instead of being tucked away where no one yeah. knows where you're at, I mean, you can go in prime time real estate. There is That's a good point. I mean, you go to every, any city in North America, and the number one sign in any retail center is uh, "Space Wanted Available." I, I always tease yes. that. I always tease that I don't know what this company is called available, but I want to buy stock in it because <laughs> it's spreading like wild. They're water. everywhere. Yeah. No, it's so true. De dentists can get it's better true. locations cheaper than ever, premium real estate. And a lot of times they can go into these centers and buy. I mean, the, the, yeah. the center's like, hell, I'll sell it to you. Yeah. Well, in uh, I grew up in Dorval, which is a suburb of Montreal. And it used to be little pharmacies. My brother brought me a nice book on the 125th anniversary of Doral as a city and places that used to be a pharmacy and a hardware store and so on are now little bistros and bars and pubs which uh it's it's still they kept the buildings which is nice I like old Montreal where they kept the old buildings you know uh, speaking of old buildings in old Montreal there's a McDonald's in old Montreal of all things and inside there's a wooden plaque dedicated to uh, I forget his full name Sierra or something or other the Cadillac, he was the founder or the discoverer of Detroit. That's where he was born in old Montreal. <laughs> and they have a plaque inside of McDonald's. So kind of cute. My friend, a friend of mine worked very hard in Montreal and in Ottawa with groups to preserve the old buildings. And now they're just, you know, it's accepted. You don't just tear them down and put up a high rise vacuum, as I call them. It's nice. Yeah. Did you see the, uh, the movie about the founder of McDonald's called The Founder? And it was Michael no. Keating. No. That was one of the most brilliant movies of the year because not only did they oh. walk you through the history, like you literally thought you're in the 1950s again in the 60s. And yeah. it was, 
And Michael Keating is such an amazing actor, but the business lessons in that movie. I mean, it's amazing how Hollywood is, is becoming a great teacher. Like, um, um, the, what was that other one? The big short, the big short, even the PhD economists are like tipping their hats Mm -hmm. saying, wow, you had, nobody can explain derivatives and nobody can explain Uh that. And you took a great movie star and you totally gave the economic lesson yeah. better than any, any teacher while well, making an I engaging was, story. When I was 11 or 12, we drove to Florida, which is a three-day drive from Montreal. And we stayed in a little motel in um, Cape, not Cape Canaveral, uh, Daytona Beach. And there was a new restaurant next door to us. And over 100,000 hamburgers sold McDonald's. <laughs> So we got a picture at home. I worked at A&W, actually, when I was 17. That was a good job. Oh, my God. And I had, loved A&W. They're good. They were, can you hear the voices in the background? Are they bothering you? You know, it's okay. Uh, it's yeah. been an hour. Our show's an hour. We're already at an hour and right. two minutes. But I, I just I just wanted to uh, – I, I've been a fan of yours for 30 years. I mean, I oh, started with been, you. I on, love your stories. Wonderful. On Mike and the Bike. Um, we've uh, – uh, uh, we've, We've been through a lot of changes yeah. in three decades, and I wanted yes. to get you on to talk to the kids. And sure. uh, I just want to tell you that I've been, been a big fan of yours for 30 years. I've oh, that's very kind. Posts. I'm just a guy in a little corner here in Ottawa, but no. I've always been, I, I check into Dental Town quite often and just, just look around and see what's no, there. You, you taught me stuff and, on IDF, on Generation Next, on I can't. Oh, I mean, my we, gosh. We, I, I, I've been reading your stuff for three decades. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, I've been oh, to your websites. Kind. I just want to tell you sincerely that I've been a big fan of yours. I've learned a lot from oh, you. My, I've enjoyed really, the camaraderie. Uh, yeah. I just think you're a hell of a great guy. And, oh, that's uh, very kind. Next time you come to the town, then I'm going to buy you some Quebec beer. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll never turn down a, a Quebec beer. But uh, yes. I hope you have a rocking hot weekend. And uh, yeah, give it's my a long weekend to your here. Wife and your, uh, why is it yeah. a long weekend? It's Her Majesty Victoria Day. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. We we celebrated for some reason. That's a great business story. So you know um, Victoria's Secret. Of course. Did you know that's lovely, named lovely after, fashions? Did you know that's named after Queen Victoria? Oh no. Do you want to know the business story about that? This is a genius business story. So there was a bit. I mean, he made a he made a billion and a half dollars in under twenty four months with this concept. Ooh. Uh, the founder of Victoria's Secret. Yeah. So if you ask someone what's Victoria's Secret, they just think you're it's a joke. What it was was this guy realized that people in America's Christian conservative values, they bundled lingerie uh, with pornography. And okay. if you wanted to go buy lingerie, you had to go to the seedy part of town that also sold x-rated movies and videos and and unsafe areas and and gross stuff and so he said i'm going to sell laundry in a mall well all the Ah. malls in america there's only like 300 they're only owned by like a dozen corporations and half of them are privately held family owned and they they pitch this laundry thing and everybody's like get out of here we're not having nasty pornography laundry and all that stuff like that so he went back to drawing burn he says i got to reposition this so he said, who's the most, these are conservative Christian Republican men that own all these malls in America. Who do they like that wore laundry? And then he realized that Queen Victoria was legendary. I mean, she ruled, she was brutal. She had an island yeah. named after her. She was all that and 10 bags of chips. But everyone knew when the day was over, she loved uh, to take off all that stuff and put on lingerie and was a little sex oh. kitten. So they oh named the whole thing after Queen Victoria. What was Victoria's secret? That uh-huh. at the end of the day, this lady was wearing lingerie and drinking wine and and uh, having you know, traveling London, whatever. So they went back and reput uh, and and repitched it. And these guys were very very cynical, but they said, "Well, we'll give it a try." And then the thing about lingerie is, you know, you take the biggest outfit they sell, and it's about like what three grams of cotton in that whole thing, and they're selling it for. <laughs> 10, 20, 30, the margins were insane. Wow. And the sales went off the roof because there were no sure. substitutes in the marketplace unless you wanted to go to the seedy part of town. Yeah. And and it, the sales were so crazy, somebody offered them like a 
one and a half billion dollars for it. Only like it wasn't even two years old, and he oh took his gosh. billion dollars and ran. I mean, yeah. what a uh, what a that's great clever, eh? Yeah, and that that's why they should watch that movie Founders because um people know that's that McDonald's out. the average McDonald's does twice the revenue of a Burger King, but they don't yeah. really know why. But you watch the Founders and and when you see how all their problems were with franchisees. And yeah. how Ray Kroc, what he did the most was he figured out the importance that each store should be an owner operator and how important it was that that be a married couple who was from the community and, yes. and not, not buying it just because they want to get rich quick and just yeah. want to buy it, but not work it. But people who are going to have only one location, a married couple from the town involved in the church, yes. the schools, the communities. And they were going to, you know, it was going to be a franchisee. And now we've moved to this Wall Street model where all these stores are not owned by anyone except. So there's one guy who's a billionaire and then mm. every every location, some franchisee employee, just like you have all this associate turnover uh, with within dentistry where when they're always employees, they're usually not there very long. I mean, it's considered yeah. if, if you're there seven years, they call it a miracle. And, and oh. a lot of them only stay a year. And and Ray Kroc beat that lesson in there that you're, you know, you, you get the right franchisees. And that's why McDonald's has twice Burger King. Because Burger King, if you just walked out of the NBA and you were a baller and you said, hey, I want to buy, I got millions. I want to buy 10 locations in Detroit. They'd say, wow, million dollars a piece. We'll take your 10 million. McDonald's yeah. owned. They'd say, no, you got to show us that. You've been working at McDonald's your whole life that you – yeah. You love this more than the NBA, that you're going to be here all day, every day, that this is this is your oh. whole life and mission and purpose. And yes. when they got, when they, vet, McDonald's uh, is, uh, um, another one is Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A only approves each year 0.04% of all their applications to get a franchise. Jeez. I mean, you almost can't get one. And they'll only sell you one. Yeah. And this has got to be your life's dream. You got to be in the business. You got to eat, live, breathe, die, sleep, Chick-fil-A. Yeah. And that's why all their, and their stores reflect that. Well, you know, that's almost like delegation. You, you delegate, they delegate to you as an owner. You're limited here. And you know, that's, that makes sense. You know, it doesn't quite go back to being a delegator in dental clinic, but are, you, are we allowed to tell a bad joke on this uh, podcast? Heck yeah. It's dentistry uncensored. Okay. Do you know why they call? You know what Victoria's secret is? What? She's a slut. <laughs> ah. what, can I say? what can I say? Okay, you said a bad joke. Are we gonna leave that on, Ryan? Or we're we gonna take that? Yeah. Leave it on. Can... Okay, then I'm gonna follow with a bad joke. So, uh, oh. Queen Victoria's a woman, and uh, you know, I uh, I love women more than men, and it seems like whenever you give something to women, they make it greater. I mean, you give them a house, they turn it into a home. You give them groceries, they turn it into a meal. You give them a little crap, they give you a ton of shit. <laughs> oh, yes. That's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all hey, uh, again, thanks for all you've done. Oh, um, well, I've been, thank been a you fan for of everything. reading your stuff for 30 years. And, uh, oh, my gosh. I feel like, I feel like you're uh, a brother from another mother in, in another oh. country. And, well, that's uh, very kind. Oh, one more thing. One more thing. i got to just one more thing. Um, about two years ago, I took an acting course. I'd, I'd acted once in high school. My wife said, oh, yeah, you know, she's pretty good with me. Took the course. I was absolutely horrible at it. But a guy on the way in says, Mike, you've got a good voice. Have you ever done voiceovers? And I said, what's voiceovers? So he had me to his studio. I did a few voiceovers. And then I got an email from a group in London, very big London, Ontario, called Voices.com. And it's a learning cycle. And I do a couple every day and I've only had a couple of jobs, but I have my demos. One of my demos is um, a very deep, very scary voice. Anyways, I got a note from Norway. This girl said, I liked your voice. We we're doing a virtual reality thing. We'd like you to play the part of Odin. Well, Odin, they pronounce it. It showed uh, won two prizes. I didn't, wasn't because of me, but it was a fun thing. They won two prizes in Europe. They went to China and she's getting money for more. And they're going to San Francisco, so you may hear my voice on the radio. <laughs> when you're at McDonald's, it could be me. Right Anyways, on. thank you, Howard. This is so much fun. Well, best of luck and enjoy your retirement. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.